Okay, we're going to start in about, uh, we'll give them about three to five minutes or so. So feel free if you want to get some coffee, uh, some something else to drink, that'd be great. Wow, yeah. I just got some great ideas I'd like to talk about. Give me a couple right here in my arm. You can't leave, Damon. I'm about to teach like the lesson of your lifetime. I mean, this is yeah well okay that's probably yeah yeah <laughs> okay so i think we'll go ahead and get started um are we good for folks online? Can folks online hear us? All right, yes, great. Yes, you're good. Well, I do wanna, uh, first of all, welcome you to our uh, Sunday School today. This is our fourth session uh, for the class, These Three Are One, which is a class on uh, the Trinity, the Christian uh, doctrine, belief, faith, affirmation of the Trinity. 
and um, we're talking particularly about how it was that Christians kind of came to this uh, confession, this understanding of who God was, and also uh, eventually uh, as we move into the latter weeks, um, what difference does it make, right? Um, sometimes this doctrine has been seen as uh, way too abstract and in some ways not relevant to the Christian life. Uh, but I think actually it, uh, nothing of it could be farther from the truth. Um, let me uh, open us with a quick word of prayer. We have some folks online. I do want to encourage folks, if you're in the room, if you can, if you can sit uh, together in, in groups so that you can have a conversation, because uh, I do at least have one uh, opening question for you uh, to talk about with each other. So let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you that you are a gracious and living God who does indeed uh, seek to bring to birth in us and through us things that are gifts, uh, realities that are gifts and people that are gifts to enrich this world so that it might become more fully that which you long for it to be. We ask and pray that you be with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so my opening question for week four. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. Is what is the, and this is, of course, is from your perspective. So again, we're not looking for right or wrong answers or anything here. What is the relationship between experience what, and I'm talking here about everyday experience, or it could be maybe spiritual experience or something like that, and belief, or I have theology up there, but, you know, maybe we don't, that might be too cumbersome, uh, but experience and belief, and I'm talking, of course, here in reference to our experience of God, of the divine, um, and what we come to believe, all right? And, the, and the, I'll give you some background for this uh, after we talk it through together, but take about four to five minutes. Maybe we could put some folks online into a, um, a breakout room, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll come back together to share. All right? So what is the relationship? How do you understand the relationship between experience and belief? About one more minute.
Okay. So just to welcome everybody uh, online. Um, I don't know if I had a chance to say hello, but uh, welcome to the folks online who are joining us. And uh, also, of course, in the room. So I gave you this question of the, uh, how do you understand the relationship between experience and belief? We're obviously talking here specifically in kind of a religious or spiritual context. We have a microphone here. So Jeff, would you mind just maybe turning that on so that we can pass that around? So what were some things that you noted in your groups? You got to hold it down. Patrick's right behind you. There we go. Okay. This microphone has got fresh batteries. So we're just <laughs> waiting for somebody to say something. That's right. Raise your hand so you won't speak all at once. I kind of forget what we said at our table. Oh, it's a bad question we said, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that probably came from Elgin. I, I can see that. Yeah, can you eye. see the twinkle? In I his can eye. see the twinkle in his so eye. So I, I think I'm going to speak for myself. So you guys speak for yourselves. I mean, if this is different than what you think, but if you have a certain belief, you interpret your experiences through that belief. So if you believe that, I mean, I'm trying to think of one, you know, anybody with red hair has a fiery temper and then somebody yells if they have red hair, you say, see, I mean, you, it, if you, we all have to be extremely careful by how, how we base our beliefs and it needs to be in scripture. So our experience, but our experiences also can help us see, I may be looking at this wrong. Um, so uh, it, it goes back and forth. That's no, that's great. I mean, this, this is one of the, by the way, this is one of the hardest areas in theological discourse and sort of the academic world, because uh, on the one hand, absolutely, like in a sense, like your beliefs kind of filter some of your experiences. They frame them, shape them. But I mean, on a certain level, the Christian faith begins with an experience, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, and I'll talk just briefly about that, and so uh, in just a minute. But that's 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 great. I mean, it, it kind of goes back and forth, uh, in a sense. Yeah, go ahead. One of the conversations we had at our table was that some of us have a more emotional experience of experiences and others of us don't get that kind of emotional thing. And the comment that was made is that that can lead to divisions, uh, judging on one side or the other that my way of doing things is right and or or jealousy. So. Okay, so the the um, the nature of experience, in a sense, can cause can be something that can cause problems. Okay, all right. I have a lady in the balcony here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I was reading a book recently, and the author talked about suffering, uh, living in um, a country that went to war, and she had twins and another small child living there and she talked about her evangelical upbringing and the fact that she went there believing that God would always protect her and her family because of their faith and their willingness to sacrifice. We helped mentor them and they chose as university students to go to the hardest place they could think of for Jesus sake. Well, she said she came to realize in that tough place, God doesn't say that he would keep them all alive. He didn't keep his son alive. And it really woke me up to examine some things I had thought I believed, but had never really gone as deep as she had. Hmm. So experience can deepen um, as well as maybe even overturn or, or alter Right. Depending on the experience, of course. Okay. All right. That's great. Elgin. 
we talked about the two being codependent that you you they feed each other they're both necessary yeah that's great i mean i and i think certainly in the christian faith uh that is absolutely the case where if you only have i think i even heard uh bob up here talking if we already believed everything we wouldn't even be here you know we, we come here for the experience in a sense, we come here to be encountered. I'm assuming is kind of what you're what you're saying, right? For God to show up and to either overturn or to deepen or to you know empower, etc. Uh, anyone else in the room? Here, Jim. Oh, hold on, Jim, let one, me give you the microphone. We'll, we'll do the microphone here because that gives it online for us. I was just going to uh, say the hostage situation in Haiti is a good example of what we were just talking about. I mean, the, uh, uh, the, they went under the guidance of spiritual beliefs that they could make a difference and now look where they are <laughs> but it doesn't mean they shouldn't have done it but it's you got to be realized the worst can still happen yeah yeah <clears throat> any other comments in the room jeff well i just say you know we're always trying to make sense of what's happening to us and give meaning to our life and get a system that will kind of work and so a lot of that ultimately turns to some sort of religious belief. And like Jim says, sometimes that works, you know, we should go help other people. So we should go to Haiti and help in the orphanage. And then we get taken hostage and maybe get killed. You know, that wasn't part of the plan. So we try to give meaning to it, but sometimes it doesn't work. Or it doesn't work the way we think it should work. Well, yeah. And, you know, our whole purpose, I'm thinking as people are saying here, our whole goal is not to die <laughs> well it kind of is you know yeah. and maybe that's not so bad but yeah. anyway yeah yeah, yeah. Bye. um and i think we had one over here bob did you want to i was just going to say that we have beliefs and unless we have the big problem of certainty of doubt and if we're certain then all all other possibilities are ruled out and so if we do, we're, we're not rigid, we constantly are using experiences to learn and to some possibly change our beliefs or enrich them or deepen them. That's why we're here today. Mm. I mean, most of us or many of us believe in the Trinity, but it's not uh, easy to grasp. And so we're here to learn more about it. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Any comments from oh, Suzanne? Did you have a comment? Well, I think when the experience brings us to our knees, we become believers real fast. Um, and our helplessness, I think we turn in a way maybe that we hadn't before to relying on God to carry us through. And so anyway, now they say, oh, good. I'm having a bad experience. That'll that'll deepen my faith. Thank you, God. I don't need we don't. But but it happens because we become helpless and we know that we have to rely on something beyond ourselves. So experience can intensify. It's the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> yeah, anyone online? I think it looks like Joe's got his hand up. Joe, I think you're, uh, you are muted. So you're gonna need to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Is that it? Yep. yep. Okay. A couple of things. Depending on what kind of belief system you're asking me about. If it's my spiritual belief system, that's one kind of experience I will have. If you ask me about my empirical science belief system, I will have a different kind of experience. My experience based on my scientific beliefs are completely different than my experiences that I have from my spiritual belief. Yeah, so it's of a different order in a sense. Correct. That's right. That's that's a good good distinction. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else online? Uh, Debbie. Um, yeah. Unmute yourself, Debbie. Is that good? Yes. Great. Well, I think somebody brought this up. I think it's sort of like um, 
The chicken and the egg question. Um, you can't have one without the other, really. Um, what you believe will be the lens that you view what happens through. And what happens is the lens through which you <clears throat> will develop or tweak your beliefs. Um, if you've never had anything good, you've grown up in a horrible situation, you've had bad experiences all through your life, it's very hard to believe that God's a loving parent and a provider and a, a safety. If you've had a great life, it's much easier. That doesn't mean that both can't come to the same place, but they just affect how that happens. Yeah, that's great. That's really, yeah, thank you. And it sounded like Tom, did you have a comment too? Uh, yeah, just, um, you know, we, we have, you know, we believe in God, uh, therefore we pray, but uh, uh, maybe our theology as well of what we believe about God uh, will shape our prayers and, and expectations as well. If, if you don't believe in prayer, you'll never have an answered prayer. Amen. Amen. I, I, this is one of those questions where like, I could just like the whole class, we could just talk about this question. So it's actually a pretty good question, actually. Elgin. <laughs> <laughs> Answers are great. Yeah. Everybody's got an A plus. Yeah. No final. I cancel the final. Yeah. What? I, well, I think that's the tough needle. And it, so the reason I wanted to talk about this question in part is because, you know, we've been walking through sort of the biblical basis for the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and one of the things that we say, uh, as I mentioned here um, on this page, right, our first very first thesis, right, is uh, that there is no doctrine of the Trinity in Scripture. The word Trinity doesn't show up. Um, you know, it's not explicitly spelled out there. And then I talked through, and we have talked through the textual patterns of speech, right? The basis, in a sense, that pushes the church, I would suggest, that pushes Christian communities in the direction that eventually they go. Uh, we spent some time, and I'll just in just a moment, I'll kind of go over a review of this, but like these patterns of speech, uh, personifications of God and Yahweh in the Old Testament, all of a sudden they begin to be transferred and used to speak about Jesus, right, as God's word, Jesus as God's wisdom, etc. Uh, raising the question, well, who exactly is Jesus, right? Uh, and again, as I also mentioned, this is not something that Christians are doing alone. There are other Jewish groups, that are um, unconnected to Christianity, who are also willing to think in this direction. And that gives us a certain kind of textual plausibility. However, behind all of that, and this is something that I have not brought up as much, but I will, I don't know if we, uh, I was hoping to get to it today, but behind all of that is the experience that people, that, that a community, the community is having in the context of worship with the risen Christ. That's, in a sense, the most vital thing that pushes them in the direction that they wind up going. Their experience of Jesus as risen, as living, um, that is really what eventually pushes them uh, in that direction. Was that me or? Okay, all right. All right, good. Okay, so so that's kind of the backdrop of, of this um, uh, and, and of why I was asking you to think about this question. So just so far, just very quick re re review, uh, right? We, we've, we've got these theses there, no, doc no fully formed doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, the word Trinitas doesn't show up uh, in scripture at all. Uh, and yet there's patterns of speech, uh, ways of talking that we do see that raise certain interesting, intriguing questions, but it's not clear. And then there's another, you know, there are these, these other texts that we talked about. Uh, so what have we done? We've talked particularly through the patterns of speech in the Old Testament or around especially these things called personifications. I talked about intermediaries or angels uh, and personifications 
uh, which uh, essentially are aspects of God that take on a life of their own, right? So God, God's wisdom, that's a faculty of God. God has wisdom, but there are places in scripture where wisdom sort of takes on a life of its own and actually speaks for itself. That's particularly the case in the book of Proverbs, and there's some other places as well. But the most important personifications basically for later you know, development of this theology are wisdom, word, and spirit. And there are two or three others that we could probably point to in the Old Testament, but these are really important. And then we threw in an additional wrinkle that was particularly um, relevant in the period known as Second Temple Judaism, which is sort of the period in which Jesus is born, lives, dies, and is raised from the dead, right? So this goes from about 500 or so BC to 70 AD, and it's called Second Temple because the Second Temple is built during this period. Remember, Solomon's Temple was built and then destroyed by the Babylonians, and then later another temple is built, and that temple eventually is destroyed by the Romans. It, during that time, there's a lot of speculation about this figure that's talked about initially in Daniel chapter 7 called the Son of Man, right? And this figure takes on a whole host of meanings. It's a messianic figure. It is a kind of figure who's going to come and save. It's a figure who sits on God's throne. That's what we certainly see that in Daniel chapter seven. And it's also a figure, this is also understood to be a figure who appears kind of at the culminating point of God's work of saving. This is at least the way that Jews are thinking about this figure. And as I mentioned, there are other places uh, where the son of man figure shows up, other, other texts. We didn't go too deep into that, but I just wanted to give you a sense that the, the Christian articulations and beliefs don't come out of the blue. There are other antecedents, and there are other groups of, of, of Jews. And remember, all early Christians are effectively Jews. Um, it's, it's not until we get into about the second generation that we start to get an influx of Gentiles and then eventually it becomes a, a predominant Gentile uh, uh, institution, movement, whatever. Uh, so the Son of Man figure, though, is important, shows up in these other texts. And then when I said we transitioned last week and we started basically to talk about the New Testament, and we noted that the New Testament takes up these patterns that we already saw in the Old Testament regarding personifications and begins to use that language as a way of talking about who exactly Jesus is. Now, the backdrop, of course, of that is he was dead, and now he's alive. Who is this person? How should we speak about this person? How, should we, how do we interact? How should we like posture ourselves with this person, et cetera? That is the sort of existential like fuel in a sense that pushes this. It's not the intellectual necessarily. It is the dire need to understand who is Jesus and what, like, what do we do with this, with, with what he stood for, with his message, his parables, his teachings, and the fact that he was dead and now alive. Like, what does all this mean? Like, that's the kind of conundrum, right? And that's the experiential component that I wanted us to kind of think a little bit about. All right. Now, there are some other elements in scripture aside from, and I, I only briefly talked about word and wisdom uh, last week. Uh, there is in particular this language of Jesus as Lord that shows up. Remember the earliest texts in the new Testament are not the gospels. The gospels are actually written later. The earliest texts are the texts that are written by the apostle Paul. They're probably written in the 50s, some of them at least, uh, and that's about, you know, a, about a generation or so after, and there are some elements in those texts, some spaces in those, those texts that scholars argue Paul actually is borrowing from the community itself. So there's places in some of Paul's letters where he's borrowing sayings and phrases that probably have a pre-life before him. So that's our oldest data effectively. And what we see in this is that from the almost from the beginning, we don't have any other evidence that could suggest otherwise. From the beginning, Jesus are uh, uh, Christians are calling Jesus Lord. 
So what do they mean by that, right? Uh, actually, Tom Cooner brought this up last week. Uh, one of the things that we see, and I'm just going to make a few points here. One of the things that we see is that for Paul, at least, this, in a sense, is what marks you off. To, to confess Jesus as Lord is what marks you off as Christian. Now, what he means by that is not just a verbal confession. He means living a life devoted. So it's a confession of loyalty, and he definitely, most definitely includes in that, of course, walking the talk. So he's not just saying it's a mental thing, and now all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a Christian or whatever. But the point is that this is somehow central to Christian identity, identifying Jesus as Lord. Well, that does not lower the pressure on the question of who is this dude and what is his relationship to Yahweh. In fact, it heightens it right? It intensifies the pressure for clarification in a sense. Um, so what does it mean? I think I've already kind of mentioned this, right? It means to identify him in a sense with Yahweh. Whether we, whether we want to, and I'm, I'm going to come back in just a moment, whether or not we want to, we understand, of course, the language of Lord can be a honorific, right? Where we greet someone who's of a higher class than we are. We might, you know, certainly in the ancient world, we might say them, call him a Lord. Um, but there's something more than that going on with Jesus. And I'm going to make an argument here, I think, that backs these up. So it identifies him with Yahweh. It is an expression of loyalty, and therefore it carries with it the connotation of discipleship or of trying to live out the values that this person stands for. And, of course, it's one of the most controversial things you could possibly say, right? about Jesus, because if it, if it does mean what I think we could make an argument that it means, that somehow Jesus is to be identified with Yahweh, we are now saying that there is a human being that is somehow to, buy, to be identified with Yahweh in a way that is completely different than anyone else and anything else. And we're talking here not only about humans, but also angels, powers, principalities, whatever you want to say. What I think leads us in this direction of saying that that really is the content that Christians are speaking, and they're not just calling, they're not just saying, you know, Mr. Jesus, <laughs> they're, you know, Lord Jesus, they're saying something more, is the fact that Jesus is not just described as Lord, but he's actually treated that way, that they do things towards Jesus or in the name of Jesus that you only do in reference to God, right? And that's, the, that's the third, this is our third point. It's not just that Jesus is called Lord, but that he's identified and treated in this way. And here is where those patterns of speech come back in, actually. So I have sort of three examples. I don't know, if, do I have these on your outline? I don't know if these are, no. So I basically have three examples here for you one of them has to do with salvation, the next one has to do with worship, and the last one has to do with prayer. And in each example, I offer to you the Old Testament text in which the, uh, whatever it is that's being said is being said about Yahweh, and what you see in a New Testament appropriation of that text is now it's to be used in reference to Jesus. And that is, that's the basic, I mean, this is where, like, either Jesus is God or Jesus is not God. And if Jesus is not God, then we need to stop doing these things, right? I mean, that's kind of the, that's, that's going to be the pressure then that will build, to, that creates the history that eventually leads to something like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. So the first one um, from Romans chapter 10 because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? So this is that one of those texts that I said uh, that I pointed to earlier about the Lordship question. For, quote, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the text that comes out of Joel. And here Paul is quoting it in reference to calling on the name of who? The Lord Jesus. Because Jesus is has to be understood as somehow identified with Yahweh. All right. We're, again, not clear. No doctrine of the Trinity. Yep. Not at all. Not saying that, but definitely raising the stakes. Who is Jesus? 
Second one is one of my favorites because it's just uh, thick with um, this question about uh, who Jesus is. And this, uh, we have, I, I offer to you the first term, the first passage comes out of Isaiah 45, it says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Think about that. It's, this is one of those absolute monotheistic passages. By myself, I have sworn from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness, a word that shall not return, quote, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That passage, which again, only to be applied to Yahweh, is now applied to Jesus. And this is one of the texts, one of the other reasons why I love this text is that many scholars believe that this passage in Philippians chapter 2, which is longer, is actually a hymn that predates Paul, that Paul appropriates this and uses it in his letter. And therefore, this would be one of the earliest data pieces that we have that gives us a sense that Christians are talking about Jesus in the highest possible terms from the very beginning. They don't have to get there over time. They just have to work out some of the metaphysics. So what does it say in Philippians chapter two? Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every name should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So uh, basically a, a appropriation and retooling of a text that if you read the Isaiah 25, I mean, that is like an absolute claim that you don't associate anyone with Yahweh. And yet now we, we must associate somehow Jesus with Yahweh. And then I provide for you a prayer example. So praying. So this is what I meant when I said in the context of worship, right? So worshiping Jesus praying in his name, being baptized in his name, saying that salvation is in his name. Uh, you know, these again are only things that you say about God. And early Christians are already saying this very early on. We also, of course, have um, the John, you know, and I, I often provide this last in part because this is the late, I mean, the Gospel of John is one of the latest books written in the canon, uh, at least in terms of the New Testament. But there is a passage here where Jesus explicitly is sort of portrayed as identifying himself with the name Yahweh, right? Uh, and, and here we have it in John chapter 8. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself from slipping away the temple guard, the, the temple ground. When he says, I am, that's a play on Exodus 3, because what is Yahweh's name? I am that I am, or I will be who I will be. And, and the response then of Jesus's hearers is entirely understandable, because he is now associating himself with Yahweh. So we have, you know, we have other portraits or whatever, but I, I particularly like the Pauline material uh, because it's so early and because it is in the context of experience, um, whereas we might have some quibbles, uh, what have you, with, with other things perhaps in the Gospels. So Jesus is Lord is central and, and around it revolves a whole host of issues that would push you in a direction like a Trinitarian affirmation, or at the very least, an affirmation that Jesus is somehow God, or at least to be identified with God. We also, of course, noted the Son of Man traditions, right? We talked about this um, uh, last week in terms of the fact that it predates, it comes out of, you know, probably about two, two centuries at least prior to uh, the, the time of Jesus. Well, this is number one, Jesus's favorite identifying title. Uh, if we're looking at the synoptic gospels, right, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, and also John, but especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus overwhelmingly describes himself as this son of man figure. So he's already identifying himself with a figure that other Jews are thinking about as like somehow to be 
associated with Yahweh because he sits on Yahweh's throne, but also as a figure who appears at the end of all things. Um, so uh, doesn't really offer necessarily a definition, right, as I say up here, uh, but other folks seem to know what he means. Not a lot of questions are given to him. And in fact, there are a couple places where he will utilize that, na that name and get himself into a lot of trouble. And one of the most um, important of those examples is the one uh, that I provide for you here, Mark 14. Um, so they're asking him, essentially, are you the Messiah? And he says, Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Those quotes inside that quote are almost direct allusions to Daniel chapter 7, right? Uh, as I mentioned here, right, it's found throughout the synoptics, um, this scene, and it it connects together, and this is sort of a side point, but it connects together that Jesus is the Messiah as the Son of Man, as this figure that Daniel uh, had sort of talked about. Uh, so I don't want to get too bogged down with all of this material here. It's clear that Son of Man does not, is not meant to be a title that affirms or emphasizes that Jesus is fully human. That's something that happens later in the history of kind of Christian theology. Um, uh, rather, to use that language is really to see yourself as somehow this heavenly figure who's come now to earth and who's living out uh, the calling uh, that he's supposed to live out to. And this, of course, is why. And, and right here, we're in Mark chapter 14, which is basically Jesus has been brought before the Sanhedrin. So he's getting ready to be tried and executed, and their response to him is, you know, the high priest tears his clothes, says we don't need to hear anything else more from him, he should be executed, right? So again, their example or their responses would be entirely understandable, right? Uh, and this is the thing, like, it's so scandalous, and yet the Christians do not back off from this because they have come somehow to see that this is somehow true. They may not have all the language yet, all the categories to make sense of it, but that's what sort of the unfolding, essentially, of the history of kind of Christian theology will deal with. Uh, one more thing, let's see what time we have here. We'll do a couple more things here and then I'll stop and take questions or comments. The next thing that kind of complicates things in terms of who exactly Jesus is, is Jesus talks an awful lot, especially this is a particularly the case in the fourth gospel, but it also happens in the other gospels. Jesus often talks about his relationship to God as a relationship to his father, right? Uh, now, this is not completely unique, but it is certainly not the norm necessarily. So there are other texts that we can point to, other Jewish texts where you might hear this language. Uh, but it's, it's quite unique in the way, particularly in the way uh, that Jesus does it in the, in the Gospel of John. And I, I literally, again, I don't want to go through here. I just want to say that this complicates how are we going to think about who Jesus is, right? And there's uh, several examples, right? He says he comes from the Father, right? <clears throat> he comes primarily to do his Father's will, Right? Um, the will that he comes to accomplish is not only his father's, but it's also his. So it's almost like the, the work that he's, he's about is, is to be understood as identical. So God is somehow working through him. Um, he also is to be understood as revealing his father uh, in and through the world, right? And the father likewise is revealing the son uh, in the world. And then finally, and this is the one I think is one of the most important, what it is that, God, that Jesus reveals about God is that ultimately God is love, right? That, I mean, this is where we, we hit that uh, John 3.16, you know, God so loved the world, all right? What Jesus is about is the fulfillment of that uh, vision, that the love of God uh, is what uh, drives him. All right, last thing then, in terms of the context of scripture, is 
we also see then, and most of what we've been talking about, of course, is Jesus. And, and that really is the historical impetus. Jesus is the problem. And I, I love to say uh, that Jesus messes everything up. And he messes everything up in terms of theology, but he also messes everything up in terms of ethics. And, you know, he just messes everything up, but in a good way, right? Uh, but the spirit is not absent. And so what we see uh, is also an intimacy in particular of the two of the personifications um, of word and spirit. And Jesus, remember, is oftentimes described as God's word. Um, these two personifications or entities, maybe, maybe persons, we're not quite, we're certainly not there yet in terms of scripture. They already have a, there's already a basis for this in the Old Testament. Um, at the very beginning of creation, what does God do? Speaks the world into existence and the spirit is present hovering, right? So, it, so, so in the act of creating, the word and the spirit are present together. Uh, and then the other sort of big moment, we could point to some certain other elements, but the other big moment is in the, in the creation and formation of the people Israel right? Uh, God gives the people um, the law, and the Spirit, in a way, is a way of talking about Yahweh's presence, intimate presence with the people, and sometimes that's under Spirit, sometimes that's under Shekinah glory, some, you know, so some of this here, there's a little bit of a wiggle room here. You also, though, see the prophets. Um, someone is a prophet, not just because they speak the truth, but because they have received the Spirit that they have that, that then empowers them to speak. So even prophetic speech, we might say, has this basic pattern. Well, when we turn to the New Testament, we see the same kind of basic pattern. Um, and, and one of the best places to turn is at the opening of, of the, the Acts of the Apostles and the event of Pentecost, right? Pentecost is kind of widely accepted as the birth, the moment of the birth of the church. Well, what happens at Pentecost? Spirit falls, and then what? Not only do they speak in tongues, but Peter gets up and preaches. So the spirit falls and words flow, right? So word and spirit are intimately involved in the birthing of the community. And then oftentimes, Paul and other places will talk about that the Christian life, in a sense, is a, is a dual reception of word and spirit. You, you hear the word, you hear about Jesus, and you receive Jesus' spirit, right? So these things go together. So uh, all these, all these, all these uh, patterns, all these dynamics, we might say, as I say here, they raise very serious questions about Jesus' relationship to God also in a subsidiary way, the spirit, perhaps. That's going to come later, though. And, and the church is going to have to wrestle with this, right? And that's really kind of the, the direction that things wind up flowing out. Now, let me stop here for a second and see what kind of comments or questions you have, because I have just a couple more things to, to share with you um, before we end. So, uh, Jeff, you have the, the mic there. Uh, we have back here, Dave. And again, the point here was to just give you the, to give you sort of the textual element, but also to root that in the fact that, you know, these communities are worshiping Jesus. And why are they doing that? And how is this not polytheism, right? That's what they, that's what eventually they have to wrestle with. Um, so Dave, I think. We learned a lot in Africa about <laughs> Trinity. <laughs> and um, we learned that a lot of uh, the believers would end their prayers by saying, um, by, the, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. I thought that was pretty amazing. That he it would include all those aspects, yeah. and we have a couple of those places in Paul. Paul uses that kind of language, that's right. 
I don't think Bob's got a comment. I was just going to say <clears throat> from the the two that are most convincing to me are the first of all in the Old Testament Genesis 126 when there's the planning session and and God says let us create mankind. Now that's pretty pretty uh, definite to me. And then of course we go to John 1 and in the beginning was the word and the word was yeah and so I guess that those are my two strongest um, attachments. Yeah, and those are very, those are two very rich places. That's right. That's right. Elgin? No? Okay. Uh, it looks like Tom, uh, go ahead. Yeah, online. No. Um, just, uh, you know, there's even like in Paul's uh, passage in Philippians, there was still, you know, and this was all done in the glory of the Father. Um, so there still is a separation between the Son and the Father, and and not the equal um, relationship. You know, so it's well. There's a. I I, I think and, it'd be better to say there's a distinction. Yeah. But whether or not there's a separation, that's an open question. But there's, uh, I know there's, there's, there was a lot of uh, quibbling about, uh, oh, it has to be the same substance and this and that. And, um, but there's uh, almost, you know, I only do what the father tells me to do, you know, almost like a um, uh, leveling of, you know, and the spirit does, you know, unless I leave, the spirit can't do what it needs to do, you know. Right, right. Uh, uh, Joe, it looks like Joe, you had your hand up. Make sure you unmute, Joe. I think you're still muted. I don't know if you. How about now? Yeah, that's great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Three things. Number one, uh, I just uh, last last week I listened to a uh, uh, YouTube lecture by N. T. Wright, uh, and he basically for a whole hour expounded the fact that Christianity is based on Pauline's writing. Number one. Number two. Uh, one of the most outstanding uh, sessions I've had at Colonial was by, bless his heart presently, Bill, uh, Bill uh, he just passed away, skips my mind, on the book of John, the writings of John. Fascinating what John is trying to do, and I don't know exactly when John wrote his gospel and the, the other writings, how interestingly John wove the word and spirit together to a new, was what I understand presently, a new church congregation. And lastly, there's a new movement, as I understand it, called from a book by George uh, Yancey called No Longer One, in which he explores the fact that what you're alluding to, Christian, is somehow presently not tearing the church apart, but presenting different perspectives about evangelicalism and Christianity to contemporary Christians. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's an interesting. Uh, and I, I, I should say, I mean, I, I'm Trinitarian, but one of the things that I find so helpful about knowing this history is that it provides it, it opens up questions about different roads that could have been taken. Right. And I think myself about this in reference, especially to relations with, uh, with the other Abrahamic faiths, right? Because they might have, there might be some openings, right? If we're not overly dogmatic about sort of the substance language and all those kinds of things. But anyway, I, that's a digression. 
let me let me let me shift us then kind of our concluding material right so we're kind of leaving the new testament uh and we're kind of entering into history so remember we will not have a class next week because it will be uh installation brunch so that's right you get to have food instead of me so that'll be good come on come on uh <laughs> And uh, so we will meet the week after. So there'll be three sessions left in November where we will uh, hopefully unpack some of the history and then get into some of the practical stuff. But as we transition into history, one of the things I wanted to highlight for you, again, is this context of, of worship and of the murkiness and the unclarity, even the, you know, even uh, Tom's comment, right, about there's a distinction or there, he, you wanted to say there was a separation and I was kind of like pushing you a little bit. There's a distinction. I don't know if there's a separation or not. Uh, and that's that in some ways mirrors the history of the development. So uh, our second thesis then from last uh, that I actually started with, it's just the same one, right? That there's a pattern in grammar in the witness of the Old New Testament that eventually pushes the church um, in a Trinitarian direction. Um, however, we want to keep in mind, and this is kind of, this is sort of the point I want to make here, that at the beginning of the Christian movement, not everyone has access to all of these texts. Like I gave you a picture that's kind of overwhelming and would be difficult to push back on, but it was sort of a composite of the whole of what we have now come to call the New Testament. Well, you know, not everybody has access to these texts. And not everyone is actually in agreement at this point in the life of the church about which text should actually be considered sacred or not. In other words, we don't have a canon, right? And canonization uh, or uniformity, and I would say we, it still isn't completely uniform because I think I told you there's 12 or 13 different canons in the Christian world. But that's, that process of having some level of uniformity, that doesn't start until the fourth century, so not everyone has access and not everyone is agreed regarding what should or should not be included. At the same time, though, what we see, even though we don't have access to all this, what we do see, especially if we can kind of not only understand or, or take for granted that Paul's letters are the earliest and that Paul might actually be drawing on material that precedes him, we see pretty much from the beginning that we have almost one of the highest views of Jesus that we could possibly have. We just don't have a kind of metaphysics about this, right? As I say here, early communities are working out how they think about Jesus's relationship to God in the context of experience. That's what we started with, right? The experience of worship, the experience of, of, of what that means to be encountered by the living Christ. And this actually leads then eventually to a really important uh, notion in the church uh, that is kind of spelled out here in Latin, lex orande, lex credende, which is that the law of worship or the law of prayer shapes the law of belief. So in a sense, experience precedes belief. And that may not be the case all the time, but that certainly is an element, a deep kind of insight that the church comes to. And so what can we see? We can see these same kind of dynamics that are going on in the New Testament. They spill out into, uh, you know, the second century and beyond. I've given to you a couple of examples uh, for you to see. One is the Didache. The Didache, also called the Teaching of the Twelve, is sort of an early manual that's produced somewhere between 70 and 170, probably in Syria. And this is a quote that pretty much sounds like Matthew 28, right? Where it says, the procedure for baptizing is as follows. After repeating all that has been said, immerse in running water in, quote, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit or of the Holy Ghost. Um, what is that? It's just a Trinitarian, you know, patterning, but there's, you know, we haven't worked out what we mean by it exactly, but we know we need to do that. And all three names need to be included. The same thing we see in terms of an actual prayer. So one of the earliest, uh, in fact, the, the first mart what's called martyrology or a martyr writing is the martyrdom of Polycarp. 
in almost every martyrology you read, there's some point at which the martyr prays. And so what I've given to you here is a prayer. I'm not going to read the whole thing from Polycarp. Now, is, does Polycarp actually say this or not? That's an open question. But whoever it is that produced this text thinks it's important that Polycarp said that. And therefore, it represents the interests of the community that produced this text. And what do we see in that prayer? We see a Trinitarian prayer. We see a prayer to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So my point is that the tensions in the New Testament, they don't go away, right? They, they, even though we don't have the language uh, yet, or the confession perhaps even yet, um, we have other confessions like Jesus is Lord. Um, we still, though, have these other practices, praying, worshiping, being baptized in, believing that salvation is in that, this name. All of that stuff is still there and still central and it, almost like a grain of sand, you know, in an oyster, right? Irritating, working away until we're going to wind up with this pearl. It's kind of the way that this is going to go. Uh, so this, I hope, gives you the, the rooting. And I, I will, to use a, a to, I'm going to use a phrase of Augustine. Uh, Augustine actually gets involved in the debate very, very late um, when they're debating about whether they should use the term person or not to name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, he pretty much says, fine, it's the least worst option. And I would suggest to you in a sense that that is a way of actually thinking about the doctrine of the Trinity as a whole, because it's complex. Um, and God is always beyond our words and conceptions, but it's the least worst option, right? The, uh, and I think this is why it takes two or 300 years, because the church has to be forced. And they're going to have to basically think through, if we don't say this, what are the implications? And that's why it takes so long, because they, they have to think that through, and they have to argue about it, et cetera. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, 1202. That makes me feel pretty good. I landed the plane somewhat around time on time. Let me see if there are any concluding comments, questions, or thoughts. I don't, can you pass the mic back there for me? Jeff, thanks. We'll take up Justin Martyr uh, next week. Christian, two questions um, that I know you can't answer now, but can you help us to understand it all, how Jesus is Lord relates to the Old Testament words of Lord, where one is all caps and one is caps and small. Secondly, is it possible for us to say um, uh, not person is the worst of the options we have, but can't we say that Jesus was clearly a person, but the Father and the Spirit are personal, but they're spirits? They're not human beings. Can't we say they're personal, but that only Jesus was a person? Wow. <laughs> I think, I mean, yeah, I think. Would you, could you answer that in 30 seconds, please? Yeah, I, I, yes or no? I think the first one. Uh, I tried to get at some of that here. So that's probably, I mean, we could talk maybe offline more about that question because there is difference, but there's also connection, continuity. I think the, que the question around person is way more complicated because the word for person in the ancient world has none of the connotations that we attach to the word person. Um, in fact, the word, the Latin word that would typically be used persona that connects to the Greek, it refers literally to a mask that a, an actor wears. And that's not actually the word that winds up being adopted. The word that actually winds up being adopted is a completely different word that doesn't necessarily con contain the connotations of person. So I, that's why I said this is the least worst option because Augustine kind of understands that this whole thing is convoluted, but we don't seem to, we need to mark off distinctions that's the main reason why they want to use that language, that 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same, and yet they're not. And the affirmation of they're not being the same is extremely important, actually, because it actually establishes the basis for creation, and it establishes the, the idea that God can tolerate and even embrace difference, which means that we, when we go into God's presence, will not be swallowed up by God, that we will have our own integrity in God's presence because God cherishes that, God loves that. And so there's a lot that's behind all that, but, uh, but we can, maybe I'll get at some of that later, but yeah. That was about the best I could, I don't think it was 30 seconds, but. Did you have a comment, Jeff? Well, not really, except the thing that's been going through my mind here as we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we, we've kind of left Leviticus in the dust. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no focus now in our belief system in obeying the 438 laws. Uh, love your Lord, your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. It's been kind of reduced to that. It's reduced to this person now, not a set of laws. Did it turn off on you? You get the idea though. <laughs> just in the sense of a personal relationship, is that kind of the, yeah. Right, and that, and that process is obviously super complex. That's right. We've, re that's right, yeah, we've retained, we retain it in a sense, in the idea of kind of the law of Christ, which basically is that boiled down, you know, Leviticus 17. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, any comments online? Any um, yes. Yeah. Oh. Tom, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just uh, a quick one for uh, uh, the Psalm 1, 110. Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, going back to uh, the two uses of Lord there, one is you might say, Yahweh said unto Adonai, or unto the king, you know. Um, sure. yeah. So, uh, to, in the English, it becomes a problem, whereas in the original text, it's not, not there. It is, but it also isn't. <laughs> or it yeah. isn't, but also yeah. actually is. There are places where Adonai is used in reference to God, um, but yeah, Yahweh is, is, is definitely the transliterated, uh, tetragrammaton name. So, uh, great points. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Let me just say a quick word of blessing as we, as we go forth, Lord, thank you for, um, thank you for the opportunity to be in fellowship with one another and with you to be invited into the fellowship that is your life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a, it is truly a blessing. Help us to be attentive to that, to the ways that we're called to spread the love that you've given to us over the course of this next week. We ask and pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Remember next week, next week, no class, and then we'll come back together in November. That's right. Two weeks. Amen.